thanks for coming out tonight. Uh, so tonight we have uh, a D of Paradise, a graduate student here giving our talk. And Astro Tours, this is the organization that runs these events. Uh, we're entirely run by the graduate students here at the University of Toronto. And so you've all been given feedback forms. If you don't have one, we'll also have some at the end that you can grab and fill out because we really value all the feedback you give. It helps us to put on great events. Um, and as a reminder, we don't have an event uh, in April because we have a special event coming up later on in a few weeks and we'll talk more about that at the end. Um, after the talk tonight we have some planetarium shows. Some of you may have already signed up for those shows. We also have uh, tickets available if you haven't signed up already. So there will be space for, for anyone to get a show probably if they really want to see one. Unfortunately, I don't know if any of you looked up when you walked over inside. It's quite cloudy. I think the forecast is for rain and snow. Rain and snow. Weird mix. Uh, but we have other activities, we have various demos, uh, we can also, we will have the dome open for uh, people to go in and just take a look at the telescopes, um, but if it's raining, we can't do any observing, unfortunately, I don't think that'll change within the next hour. Uh, so without any more battling on by me, uh, tonight we have, uh, as mentioned, the of Paradise, he's a third year PhD student here, and he's studying climate uh, and habitability of, of exoplanets, of other planets, uh, by running models and doing theoretical work to try and understand that, and that's part of what he's going to be talking about tonight. Uh, in his spare time, he enjoys playing ultimate frisbee and also paying very, very close attention to fish tank chemistry. You can also ask him about that, and he will go on for a very, very long time. Um, welcome, Eddie. Thank you, Elisa. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Uh, can everyone hear me okay? Check in the back. Thumbs up if you can hear me okay in the back. Okay. Not that, okay. Uh, how about if I speak up a little bit more like this? Is that better? Okay. <laughs> okay, I, I'll, we'll, we'll see if that works, okay? Great. What is our place in the universe? This is a question that humans have been asking pretty much as long as we've been able to ask questions. Uh, and we asked it in various different ways. Sometimes we ask, well, you know, uh, how do we fit in? What's the meaning of life? What's our purpose? But one of the ways that we ask it is, are we alone? What is the status of life on Earth and humanity as relates to life in general? Are we it, or is there life elsewhere? We have many reasons for asking this question. For some people, it's just purely philosophical. You know, what is what is our place in the grand scheme of things? For others, it's more practical. Uh, you know, is there a plan B? It is an astrophysical certainty that at some point, Earth will not be suitable for human life. Uh, either through some cataclysm, as has happened many times in the past in Earth's history, or simply because eventually the sun will grow old, it will grow large, red, and hot, and bake the Earth to a crisp. Eventually, humans will not survive on Earth. So some people want to know if there's life elsewhere because then, hey, we could go there maybe. Maybe that would be a good backup plan. For others, it's just sheer curiosity. How would life turn out differently uh, if it started somewhere else in different conditions, with different ingredients, with different evolutionary pressures? In Earth's own fossil record, we have lots and lots of evidence that life has turned out in many different ways that are nothing like what we see now. So it's not unreasonable to think that uh, even our wildest imaginations, like you might see in, say, James Cameron's movie Avatar, that even that might not be quite as strange as what you might find out there. So for some people, the question is about what could go differently. So that makes it an interesting question for astronomers to think about. Uh, so one of the ways that we do that is through what's called biosignatures. Uh, now, biosignatures uh, are things that uh, we can see that we think could only exist uh, if something was producing them, that they, we think they wouldn't survive without life. So that's things like oxygen. Oxygen tends to react pretty quickly with rocks and with other compounds uh, and with other gases. Uh, on Earth, oxygen only really became a prominent part of the atmosphere when photosynthesis evolved. Methane's another one, and also pretty reactive. Nitrogen. Uh, some people say that Earth's atmosphere couldn't be mostly nitrogen without life 
to continuously bring it through geological cycles, uh, bring it out of the ground and back into the atmosphere. Ozone, also a pretty common one. Uh, ozone tends to break apart in sunlight, so if you're producing more ozone and oxygen, then you can have more of it. Radio broadcasts uh, is a pretty obvious one. If you're getting a phone call, it's, it's probably from somebody. And of course, giant malevolent spaceships. <laughs> if giant spaceships show up, that's a pretty good indication of life. Uh, but this talk is not going to be about those, uh, because for each one of these, except the last one and maybe the last two, uh, you can think of some way that you could produce this without life. So in terms of looking for life, it's, it's not a sure bet. Uh, and that's because when you're looking for biosignatures, you're looking for life itself. You're looking for unambiguous evidence that the, yes, there is life on this planet. And that's really hard for a lot of reasons. So I want to introduce a second topic, uh, or a, another concept called habitability. The ability for some place to be habitable to support life. So if we look for habitability instead of biosignatures, then really we're looking for the places that could have life under the assumption that if they could have life, then they probably have life. It's an assumption, but not the worst assumption we could make. So what we do and what I do is we look for planets that have habitable climates. So what do we mean by uh, habitable climate? Uh, we mean basically this. So this is a map of Earth's surface temperature. Uh, red and orange is warm and blue and violet is cold. Uh, and you can see this makes sense, you know, near the poles in Canada, it's cold, everywhere else it's warm. These white brushy things indicate where wind is flowing. So you can kind of see like, okay, these are the conditions on Earth. Uh, and if you were to look at any one point on this map, and you had the temperature there at that time and the wind speed there at that time, well, that's the weather. But all of this together, that's climate. The entire world, its, condi its conditions, how they change over time, when we talk about climate, we're talking about the sum total of the conditions on Earth that make it Earth, that make it a nice place for us to live, where we can live very comfortably, uh, you know, just have to wear a jacket, maybe an umbrella, if it's raining a little bit. But so why care about climate? Why is this a useful way for us to narrow down habitability? You know, why can't we just say, well, you know, clearly Earth's climate is nice, but who are we to say that some other climate isn't nice? And to answer that, we have to talk about the word habitable, because this is a terrible word. This gives me so much trouble because it is the most ambiguous word in astronomy, bar none. Because what habitable means is able to support life. But the next question is, what is life? We have one data point. We know about life on Earth. We have no evidence of life anywhere else. We don't know how it would emerge anywhere else. We don't know what it would require. So talking about a place that could support life means that you're basically walking blind. But obviously we need to have some way to answer the question. So we go back to Earth life and we look at what are the basics? What makes Earth life, uh, what, what do we all have in common? So for one, we all share the same building blocks. Uh, we're made up of amino acids and sugars uh, and fats and proteins, DNA. And we all depend on water, specifically liquid water. Everybody here is made of mostly water. It's in our cells. Every living thing is made of mostly water. So that leads us to the conclusion that we should follow the water. You may have heard this as NASA's mantra for the search for life. And the reason we do this is because on Earth, wherever you find liquid water, you tend to find life. And you find a lot of it. So the assumption we make then is that if we look for a place that has liquid water and we find liquid water, then if life were to arise elsewhere, it would probably arise there. So this forms the foundation for the search for life in terms of habitability, as we look for planets that can support liquid water. That's useful. That's something we can work with because liquid water only exists in certain temperature ranges, which we're very familiar with because we encounter them every day. When you boil uh, water for tea, you are reaching the upper end of that temperature. When you walk outside, you've just walked below that temperature. So we can use this to define the concept of the habitable, habitable zone, which you may have heard, and it's the range of distances from a star at which you could have conditions with temperatures able to support liquid water. So you can see here is our own solar system. Uh, we have Venus on the left, Earth and then Mars. 
uh, on the x-axis here is the amount of sunlight relative to what we get now. So over on the left, it's closer to, uh, to the sun and therefore warmer. You get more sunlight. Further away, it's colder. And you can see that we have sort of two different zones defined, conservative and optimistic. And what that means for conservative is here's where we're playing it safe. We're making sort of very conservative, strict assumptions. Uh, and we're saying, okay, well, these other things might be, but we're not going to consider them. Optimistic is the other way around, where you say, well, this is based on some shaky assumptions, but, you know, maybe. So you can see the Earth is near the inner edge of the optimistic, or the conservative one. Mars is near the outer edge. Uh, Venus is just past the inner edge. And because this is all based on assumptions about how planets work and, you know, what is habitable, depending on who you ask, these lines change a little bit. Some people put Earth closer to the line, some not. Some people put Venus just in the line. Some people put Mars just outside the line. Depends who you ask. So on the inner edge, these planets don't have liquid water because they're far too hot. Venus is a good example. And on the outer edge, they're far too cold. So we can ask, okay, well, uh, what about other stars beyond just the sun? Do we have other habitable zones? Well, stars come in different sizes, different temperatures, different brightnesses, and they emit different colors of light. A small, cool star is mostly red light. So their habitable zones depend, uh, behave a little bit differently, slightly different shapes. So that's what you see here is the shape changes with different stellar temperatures. And you can see over on the bottom, there's a whole bunch of planets there. These are all roughly Earth-sized planets that we have discovered that are in the habitable zones of their stars. And that's really exciting because, oh my gosh, we have a whole bunch that could be habitable. So, and like, it gets better because this one here on the bottom, I don't know if you can all see it, this is the TRAPPIST-1 system. It has seven planets total. Almost all of them are roughly Earth size. It has three in the conservative habitable zone. That's fantastic. And a fourth may be habitable. You know, gosh, three or four planets that could all have life. Imagine that. Here's another really good one. This is Proxima Centauri b. This planet has the distinction of being the closest Earth-sized planet in the habitable zone that we will ever discover because this planet orbits the nearest star to Earth besides the Sun, just four light years away. Hey, that's fantastic. It's in the conservative habitable zone. It's not even near the edge. It's right in a nice spot. It's roughly Earth's size and it's close by. Maybe we could even visit it. For sure, it's easier to observe because it's so close. Unfortunately, Probably not. Uh, as it turns out, some stars uh, can be more violent than others. They have solar flares. On Earth, we occasionally see solar flares and they cause northern lights. It's not a big deal, but we're pretty far away from our star. Proxima Centauri b has a year that lasts just 11 days, so it's a lot closer, so flares are a lot worse. And there was a team that just last week announced that they had seen Proxima Centauri, the star, give off a flare that was so much more powerful than we thought the star was capable of doing thousands and thousands of times more strong. So strong that for just two minutes, its star became a thousand times brighter. That's bad news because we haven't been watching for that long. So chances are those things are pretty, pretty regular. So Proxima Centauri b has been sandblasted clean, probably not habitable, but still pretty cool that it's there. So, okay, you might say it, Eve, you've shown us all of these amazing planets that are, you know, maybe habitable. Maybe some of them are not so much like Proxima Centauri b, but, you know, hey, isn't that the end of the story then? We found a whole bunch in the habitable zone. They're potentially habitable, Earth 2.0. Done, we can go home. Well, not quite, uh, and that's where climate comes in. Uh, because we talked about there being planets that are too hot and too cold in relation to their distance from the star, but you can also define that just in terms of the climate itself. What if the climate was too hot, even though it was in the habitable zone? So that's what we call a runaway greenhouse. This is a picture of Venus. Venus is in just such a state. What that means is that the planet got warm enough that any oceans evaporated, all that water vapor also captured heat, and the planet just got hotter and hotter and hotter and hotter. It couldn't cool down. So Venus has a surface temperature of 500 degrees Celsius. That's hotter than Mercury. Now Venus is not in the habitable zone, but this state is entirely possible for Earth to be in. If you put enough CO2 in the atmosphere, Earth becomes in this state. Now, don't worry about climate change leading to that because even under the worst assumptions, we're not gonna come anywhere near close to this. You know, so this is, this is not in our likely future, uh, at least in the immediate sort of 
next million or two years. And for humans, this is not a concern. But if we're looking for planets, they very well could be in that state. On the cold side, planets can be in what's called a snowball state. This is where ice completely encases the planet all the way down to the equator, glaciers everywhere, the worst ice age imaginable. That looks pretty bad. As it turns out, actually, Earth has been in this state at least twice. We have pretty good geological evidence that glaciers made it to the equator once about 2 billion years ago, uh, and once about 800 million years or so ago. And for a long time, the first time, it stayed there for a couple hundred million years. The second time, only like maybe 10 to 50 million years, but still, it's a long time. Uh, now, obviously, you know, Earth, on, on Earth, life emerged a couple billion years ago, and we're still here, so this, this was not a deal breaker for life. Uh, so take that as, so using this as an edge to the habitable zone, take it with a grain of salt. But if we see a planet like this, it's not going to be very interesting in terms of looking for life because it's all under the ice. We wouldn't want to go there, you know, it's like Antarctica in the winter. No one wants to live there, except for some people who do like cosmology, but that's a different talk. Um, so this leads us to the question of, you know, can we actually measure the habitability then? You know, clearly just knowing how far it is from the star isn't enough. Clearly we have to actually look at the planet and find some way to observe it and learn something that we can say, yes, it's habitable or no, it's not. So this leads me to how it is that we observe exoplanets. We have a couple different ways. One of them is called the transit method. Uh, we can use this method when the planet passes between us and its star. And when it does that, it blocks a little bit of light. And so the star dims a little bit. Uh, so here this is time on the x-axis, over there it's just space. And you can see that when the planet passes between us and the star, you see a dip. And that's called a transit. And what's great about this is it repeats every time the planet goes around. So you can get the, the length of the planet's year, you can see how long it's going, how far it is from the star. And the larger the planet is, the more light it's going to block. So the depth of the transit tells us how big the planet is. And we can even learn about the planet's atmosphere, because when the planet passes in front of the star, some light's going to hit the solid part, this brown thing, and it's, you know, none of the light that hits that's going to go through, because you can't see through rock. Uh, but some of it's going to hit the atmosphere and just pass right on through. Now, atmospheres are made of different kinds of gases, and different gases absorb light differently. So if this atmosphere is made of gas that doesn't absorb light, uh, for whatever reason, then you'd have what we call a flat spectrum, where you basically don't see the atmosphere there, because it's not blocking any light. But if it has a gas, a little bit of a gas that absorbs some red light, then any red light is going to get stopped by the atmosphere, and the planet will appear a little bit bigger. The transit will get deeper in that wavelength. And if it has another gas that absorbs green light, and maybe there's more of that gas, or maybe it absorbs more strongly, then even more so, the atmosphere looks even bigger, the transit is deeper. Same with another, maybe another wavelength in the blue light. And so you can do this, you can look through all the different wavelengths and measure the depth of the transit and put together a spectrum of the atmosphere. And that tells you what compounds are in the atmosphere. So for Earth, that looks a little bit like this. Here, this shaded area is light passing through, and you can see where it dips down. That's where light is being absorbed. And over here on the bottom, you can see that we can label these dips. We know which ones are caused by which. And there's oxygen, water, carbon dioxide. And well, gosh, we can just look at a transit spectrum and understand what the atmosphere is like, and maybe understand if it's habitable or not. Another method we can use is called radial velocity. Uh, the reason we can use this is because when the planet orbits its star, it tugs on the star a little bit, and the star wobbles. So if we watch the star wobble a little bit back and forth, then we can learn things about the planet, because the amount by which it wobbles depends on how heavy the planet is. So with this method, we get how heavy the planet is. With transits, we get how big it is. Put the two together, you have the density of the planet. Cool, now we can maybe say what it's made of. And finally, I think one of the coolest techniques uh, is called direct imaging. This is just taking a picture of the planet. Uh, so this is actually work done by some Canadians, uh, and this is a uh, planetary system uh, relatively far away. What we've done here, the star is in the middle, and we've blocked it out because planets are dim. They're really, really dim, and stars are really bright. It's like trying to see a firefly next to the floodlights of a sports stadium. Really, really hard. But we've gotten pretty good at it, uh, unfortunately, it's still a pretty new technique, so we can only do it for systems like this, where the planets are all really, really far from the star, 
and all really big and really young, so they're still very hot, and so they're actually quite, quite a bit brighter. But we should be able to do this for Earth-sized planets in the next 10 years or so. There are new telescopes coming online, uh, new things to look at. So this is very promising, because if you can take a picture, you only have a few pixels, but hey, you could learn a lot from just a few pixels. Now, there are some problems with uh, these observational techniques uh, in terms of what we can learn. For one, when we look at the spectrum, it tells us what it's made of, but it only tells us the fraction. It doesn't tell us how much of it. So if, say, you have two planets, planet A and planet B, uh, and they're both made of two gases, X and Y, well, these both have the same composition. They both have 60% X, 40% Y. But planet A's atmosphere is maybe twice as heavy as planet B's. Well, that's a big difference because the mass of the atmosphere, how heavy it is, also determines how hot it is on the planet. And we have no way of knowing this just from that spectrum. Another problem, I said we could get the density in from that, figure out what it's made of, but there are multiple possible answers for that. So here we have two planets that have the same density. One of them has a small, rocky iron core, very dense, very heavy, and a really, really big atmosphere made of hydrogen and helium. If you've ever held a helium balloon, you know that helium is not a very heavy gas. Or it could also be a planet that's made almost entirely of water and ice, less dense than Earth and with a thin atmosphere made of water and carbon dioxide. That's also a, valuable, a valid explanation for these two things. So just from the density, we also can't really figure that out. This is kind of like if you have an avocado and a baseball, not being able to tell them apart. An avocado and a baseball have roughly the same density. So, you know, analogous, but kind of suck if you can't tell those apart. Uh, and now here's where it starts to get a little bit more hairy. Uh, atmospheres are thicker the closer they are to the ground, uh, which means that they block more light. Uh, so when we see sort of the, the way that we figure out how big the solid part of the planet is, is we look at the transits and we pick the smallest radius, the smallest diameter the, for the planet. And we say that's probably the ground. But what if it's not? What if it's just where the atmosphere is thick enough to block enough of the light that we can't tell that you can go deeper? That's a really real, that, that's a very real problem because then you don't actually know how big the planet is you don't know what its actual solid density is. The same is true both in transmission and reflection. So even with direct imaging, you might not see all the way to the ground. This gets even worse if you include clouds. Clouds are the worst. We have evidence of that tonight because clouds block all of the light. It doesn't matter what the wavelength is, if there's a cloud, it's gonna block it. So if a planet has a layer of clouds, we don't see below them. That means that we think the cloud deck is the surface. That's really bad, especially if it's a planet like Venus, where the clouds are really high up. Because then, you think the atmosphere you're seeing is all you get, and it's thin. But Venus's atmosphere is 80 times more heavy, more massive than Earth's atmosphere. And you miss all of that just because of the cloud deck. And maybe the most frustrating problem is that some gases don't block light. So carbon dioxide, blocks light very well. It has a complicated spectrum. It produces lots of features, lots of, lots of dips. Nitrogen, N2, does not. It doesn't absorb any light in the wavelengths that we're looking. And we're looking at a lot of wavelengths, optical, infrared, all of that. Nitrogen doesn't block any of it. It's what we call an invisible gas. That's a problem because on Earth, as you may or may not know, our atmosphere is mostly nitrogen. So if you were to look at Earth uh, in transmission and take a spectrum of its atmosphere, our atmosphere would look like pure oxygen. Now, clearly that's not the case because if we lived in pure oxygen, we would all spontaneously combust. Exactly, you nailed it. Which brings me to an interesting little diversion because that's not that out of, that, that, that's not that unimaginable, uh, unimaginable. This is actually something that came out uh, about a month ago. Someone proposed that, well, if you had a planet that was mostly water, with a water ocean and a water atmosphere, then when light hits the water in the atmosphere, sometimes light can break apart water and produces hydrogen and oxygen. This is similar to what your chemistry teacher did in high school when they blew up a balloon full of hydrogen. They separate it by just putting energy into the water molecule. So light hits the atmosphere, which is mostly water, splits apart the water, creates hydrogen, oxygen, and now you start to have a buildup of the two gases in the atmosphere. Note that this is not life producing oxygen. This is a way to get it without life. Now some of the hydrogen will escape to space, some of the oxygen gets pulled into the ocean, but if that happens more slowly than 
it's being produced by the light splitting apart the water molecules, then you can really get a lot of hydrogen, a lot of oxygen together in the atmosphere. And when that happens, if you have enough of it, eventually the entire atmosphere would combust. Just one great big fireball. And when that happens, that reaction produces water. So it just goes back to how it started. So this probably keeps on going in these cycles of just spontaneous combustion you know, every like 10 million years or something. So this is the incredible tale of the exploding planet. And this is completely physically plausible, which makes me very happy that the universe is this weird. So anyway, so the problems with observations, we don't know some things. We don't know anything about the surface because we can't see down to it, even if we had the resolution. We don't know how heavy the solid part is, so we don't really know what the gravity is like uh, or what even the solid planet is made of. We don't know how heavy the atmosphere is, so we don't know how much light it's going to block. We don't know how tall it is, so we can't even try to constrain these by figuring out some fractions of the planet that has to be one versus the other. And we don't know what the atmosphere is even made of, because we can't see things like nitrogen, which might be the primary component. So basically, we know nothing. We're this guy. <laughs> so okay, so observations are not that helpful. Fine. But you know, not every answer is equally likely. The exploding planet is cool, but probably most planets aren't like that. Uh, probably most of them have something other than water. Um, can we do simulations to maybe try to nail it down? Uh, this is not unreasonable. We do this in other parts of astronomy. Uh, when we discover a planet, uh, a planet and we're not sure about its orbit, if there are multiple planets, we can do simulations to try to figure out what's stable. So let's do the same thing. So we found a planet. Fantastic. It's roughly the size of Earth. It's in the habitable zone. We want to know what it looks like. What's the climate like? Can this support life? So what do we need for this? We need to know how heavy the atmosphere is. We need to know what it's made of. OK, these are things that we don't really know. But we can make some assumptions. You know, We have a simulation. We have computer time. We'll just round a whole bunch of times at different configurations. It'll be fine. So the first thing we really need to know is we need to know how fast it rotates, because that determines what kind of planet we get. And that's because of what's called the Coriolis effect. So this is what uh, causes tornadoes and hurricanes to rotate in different directions in different hemispheres. And the way it works is that if you move from the equator northward, you tend to get deflected eastward. We don't notice it at our walking speed because we're not moving that fast, but air notices it quite a, quite a lot. And that leads to rotating bands in the atmosphere. So this is the top of Earth's atmosphere, or near the top at least, uh, showing wind speed and direction. So pink and orange and purple is faster wind and blue is not a whole lot of wind. And so you can see that we have you know, sort of three to four large, well-organized bands that rotate in opposite directions. Very similar actually to how Jupiter works, because this is a common thing around planets, is that they tend to have these counter-rotating bands because of the Coriolis effect. A little bit closer to the ground, this organizes into the jet streams, uh, which we know and love as the things that bring us the polar vortex. Uh, they're instrumental in shaping how heat is moved around the planet. So if we want to know about temperature and heat transport on the planet, we need to know about the circulation and the rotation. So a really simple case is uh, planets that are what's called tidally locked. Uh, so this is the condition that you get when the planet always has the same side facing the sun because it rotates exactly once for every orbit. The moon does this too. This is why we only ever see the same side of the moon. This is fairly, rec fairly recognizable. This is what you see if you look up in the sky, maybe with not quite as much detail. Nobody recognizes this unless you've gone and done your research. This is the other side of the moon. This is the far side of the moon that we never see from Earth. We had to send spacecraft around to the back side to see this. And that's because the moon is tidally locked. So for a tidally locked planet, we call these eyeball planets. Because if you look at the temperature of the planet and you map it onto a sphere, the day side, which you can see lit up here, has a hot spot where it's always in perpetual sunlight, perpetual noon. And on the night side, perpetual night. Nighttime for billions of years. It gets very, very cold. So it looks kind of like an eyeball, so we call it eyeball planets. Now if you look at what it actually looks like, you have ice sheets that extend all the way across the night side. You know, frozen tundra, Antarctica, it's, it's a terrible place to live. And on the day side, you have areas that aren't frozen. And if there's water there, well, water tends to evaporate when you uh, heat it up. 
So you end up with these permanent storm systems, a hurricane the size of a continent sitting there permanently under the, under the, uh, under the star. Another type of planet that you might get is uh, what we call a lobster planet, uh, a slightly different rotation rate. This is if you include a little bit more ocean heat transport. Uh, we call it a lobster planet because it kind of looks like a lobster and there are little, like lobes of like claws and like a tail. I'll, I'll make it easier to show. See? <laughs> kind of like a lobster. It, it's fairly clear if you look at the sea ice. So if this planet is entirely ocean, uh, white is where the ice is and blue is where there's open water. The arrows represent wind and the direction the wind is going. And this looks a little bit more like a lobster. It's got like a head and claws and a tail. So lobster planet. Where it gets really interesting is if you change the ocean from salt water to fresh water, that changes how the ocean moves heat around and now it makes like a nice little heart. So there's really this huge range of things that we get just by nailing down the rotation rate. So we'll assume something. Uh, most planets that are close to their stars are tidally locked. Uh, that's because the closer you are, the faster you get to that state. The moon got to that state after just maybe 10 to 30 million years. Uh, so a planet, like say the one we've discovered, if say it's close to its star, maybe it's like Proxima Centauri with a year of maybe 10, 15 days, we'll say it's tidally locked. That's good, because if we know how long the year is, we know how long its day is. We know its rotation rate. So that means we can maybe try to predict what the jet streams look like, how they move heat around. That's not the end of the story for that, though, because you can see that these have really complicated shapes. This is not quite as simple and idealistic as I showed you in those simulations. This is affected by things like continents and land and mountains. So we need to know about the mountains and continents on this planet. You can see that really obviously on Earth, this is the Himalayas. South of the Himalayas, it's very green. North of the Himalayas, it's very dry. Part of that is elevation, but part of that is because the mountains affect how air flows around Asia. You can see it even more clearly if you look at the Sahara. As wind moves across the Sahara, it moves generally westward, and it picks up sand and dust, and it carries it out over the Atlantic. And that's what you see here, this kind of brownish fuzz. That is dust being carried away from the Sahara across the Atlantic to Brazil, uh, where our simulations show it actually probably affects the weather in Brazil. So if you want to know the weather in Brazil or the climate in Brazil, you have to know what the air hits first because it's going to bring dust over if it passes over the Sahara. So if we want to know about the circulation patterns, we need to know about the mountains and continents. But we don't have that. We have like one pixel if we were lucky. We have a transit. We have transmission spectroscopy. We don't have mountains and continents. But we could ask a geologist because mountains and continents form for a reason. Maybe they can help us. So we go to the geologist and we say, hey, how do mountains form and how can you help us figure out where they form? And the geologist explains that it all depends on something called plate tectonics. Earth's crust is divided into these plates that move around and bump into each other and push and stretch and all that. Uh, and that's what forms mountains, is when they buckle like that. So if you want to know about the mountains and continents, then you need to know about how fast those plates move around, how much they hit each other. The rate at which that happens depends on whether or not you have oceans. As it turns out, water lubricates the rock, makes it softer, it melts a little bit more easily. Uh, and so it's, as it turns out, very important for plate tectonics. You also need to know the temperature of the oceans, because as it turns out, and we're learning a lot from this geologist, the rate at which the plates move depends on the temperature of the seawater, not the mantle underneath. So you need to know how warm the ocean is. So how warm are the oceans? Well, we don't know that either. Uh, we're astronomers, we, we don't know this stuff. Um, so let's ask an oceanographer. You know, they might know, they, they study oceans. So the oceanographer asks, well, how deep are your oceans? Well, we don't really know that either, but we can make some estimate. Uh, we know roughly how big the planet is. Uh, we know on Earth how deep the oceans are. This is a map of the uh, depth of the ocean. Uh, the white areas are where it's not as deep, and blue is where it's a little bit deeper. And you can see you know, it's roughly the same depth in most places. So maybe we can just make a reasonable assumption about you know, how deep the ocean is likely to be based on maybe how strong gravity is on this planet. Maybe it like squishes the ocean basins or something. We'll make an assumption. 
Then the oceanographer asks, where are the continents and how much land is there? And you give the oceanographer a look, like, why do you want to know that? And the oceanographer says, well, because you need to know about the ocean currents. Earth's oceans have currents, which you can see here in the green and red, uh, that flow throughout the oceans uh, in these really well-organized sort of swirling patterns. And you can see that they depend on where the continents are. They interact with the continents, they track their sides, they form off the points of continents. And those ocean currents are really important for transporting heat around the planet. You can see here, near the top, the Gulf Stream is pulling warm water up towards Europe. That's a huge part of why Europe can have people living there really relatively comfortably. That's why France is nice. So if you want to know about the ocean currents, then you have to know about the mountains and the continents. You have to know where the land is. So that's a problem because we don't know where the continents are. That was the whole point of talking to the geologist. And then the two of them together point out that, well, actually, it's a lot more complicated than even that. Everything depends on the other things, and it's just all very complicated and, and uh, complex. And at this point, we're like, well, gosh, everything's circular. It all depends on itself. Basically, if we want to build a model of this planet and predict its climate, you have to include an entire planet in this model. So at this point, you know, you're, you're pretty depressed because <laughs> you're trying to do a PhD and you're trying to figure out <laughs> how to find these habitable planets. And it's all circular. So is, is, it, is this a dead end? Are we just completely lost at sea, unable to determine if planets can support life? Well, maybe not. Maybe there's some hope and maybe we can actually pull something out of this. Because the key here is that everything was connected. All of the different systems affected each other, interacted in various complex ways that were difficult to understand, but nonetheless there. So maybe the things that we can observe change in response to the things that we can't. So if that's the case, then the key to understanding how a planet might be habitable and identifying if it's habitable and predicting if it's habitable is understanding how climate works at a fundamental level. How do the different things interact? And for that, we need to look back to Earth. We need to really understand how Earth's climate works. And we still have a lot to learn about that. We know surprisingly little about all the different ways that the different parts of our planet interact. This is not to say that climate scientists don't know, what don't know what they're talking about. We know enough to know that the climate is warming. We know enough to know roughly how much it will warm by. What we don't know is how the different systems respond to changes. That is still an area of active debate. That's where most of the disagreement is in climate science is in how do these various feedbacks and interactions work. And those are the same things that we need to know if we want to study habitability. So maybe we can learn some lessons about Earth from studying exoplanets and their habitability. Everything on Earth is dramatically interconnected. Uh, so maybe in order to understand habitability, we have to first understand our own home. So when I'm confronted by this, uh, I'm struck with just how big this problem is. There are so many things that need to tie into this. We haven't even talked about forests and how life affects weather and the climate. All of these things need to come into play. And it is inescapably clear that Earth is just incredibly big. And that's sometimes a little bit surprising, especially in astronomy, because we like to talk about planets being small. They're relatively small compared to everything else in the universe. Earth is a pretty small planet. So it's really easy for us as astronomers to fall into the trap of thinking about planets as simple idealized systems, you know, single data points, like those earlier models. But really, Earth is this giant, complex, vast place with a huge diversity of landscapes and ecosystems. I mean, people talk about how the world is getting smaller, and in some ways it is because you can travel everywhere very fast and you can talk to anyone anywhere in the world, but the world is still just as big as it ever was. You could travel for your entire lifetime and not see even a fraction of the world. So I'm really struck by just the sheer complexity and vastness and diversity of this problem, of, the, and of, of this planet. I mean, look, these little things here are trees. This is a huge landscape. 
Last summer, I took a road trip across uh, the US and Canada to get to the Pacific Northwest to see the eclipse. And I went with my friend Jason, another grad student here. After driving across North Dakota and Montana, uh, Jason now takes personal offense when people say that Earth is small. <laughs> because Earth is unimaginably big. This is a picture from that trip. This is just North Dakota. Who knew? I thought North Dakota was flat. No, it's a really big place. The Earth is really big. And not only that, but interconnected. And that means that you have to maybe change your perspective about how we interact with the Earth. Now, I certainly do, because what this tells me is that my actions here, my experiences here in Toronto, are affected by and affect people elsewhere in the world. In Indonesia, in Brazil, in Russia. And so I have to think about this as a more global place. We have to think about Earth holistically. We need to understand that we all share the same planet because our mutual experiences affect and are affected by the experiences of everyone else on the planet. So for me, this leads me to maybe think about humanity in a slightly different way. We need to look at Earth and understand our own home if we're going to understand habitability. In 1978, Carl Sagan wrote that in the deepest sense, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence is a search for ourselves. So this brings us back to that first point. Uh, what is our place in the universe and are we alone? What Carl Sagan meant by this and what many people take from this is that in looking for life elsewhere, if we were to find something or maybe not find something, that would tell us something about ourselves and our identities as humans and our place in the universe. But I think that there's another way to understand this. And I think it's that if we really want to look for life, if we really want to look for intelligent life, we really have to understand ourselves first. We have to understand the home we live in. We have to understand what it is to be human. Now that's where everyone else comes in, where you all come in. Because us astronomers, we can keep on looking for planets. And we will. We'll keep on looking for them. We'll keep trying to characterize them. I will keep plugging away at my code trying to understand how climate works. But ultimately the question of what is humanity is something that requires a lot more than just that. It requires more than science. It requires economics and politics and business and religion and arts and literature. It requires the entire range of human experience. It is a question that can only be answered by the sum total of all of humanity. Everyone's experiences are all part of answering that question, what is it to be human? Thank you. I'll take your questions. Yeah, sure, I can pick. Okay, you're itching for a question? So, um, I've noticed both the look at the moon and uh, the picture you showed. All of them you can see have those black spots on it. You guys can tell you some different um, I don't know what they are. But the, yeah, the, but the yeah. other, the far side of the moon didn't have those dark spots. So it was all pretty, yeah, it was like, if you compare it, it's really uniform. Does that have anything to do with that? Uh, Okay, so the question for those who couldn't hear uh, is the moon has these two sides. This is the side we see, this is the side we don't. They look very, very different. So why is it that we have these dark spots and is it related to this eyeball effect that we see with highly locked planets? Uh, so the answer is maybe. Uh, we don't fully understand why this is the case. These are lunar maria, and there are areas where there was lava flows a little bit more recently. So that suggests the temperature was maybe warmer. Uh, and some have suggested that, you know, when the moon was still becoming tidally locked, the Earth was still relatively hot from the impact that formed the moon. We think the, more, the moon formed as a result of a giant impact. So for a long time, Earth would have been a lava ocean. So maybe Earth was really bright, and maybe that warmed up the moon. That's one hypothesis. Uh, we do know that the near side of the moon, this side, has a higher concentration of radioactive elements uh, that produce some heat. So it could be just that this side cooled a little bit slower. We don't really know, um, but it is probably related to the fact that it's tightly locked. Um, and that seems pretty obvious just because of the symmetry here. 
Uh, I saw your hand first. Yeah, is there anybody taking these hugely expensive global warming models that are based on Earth and have the contribution of probably thousands of very skilled people and just saying, okay, that's Earth, well, let's just bugger up a whole bunch of settings and make it an alien world and see how that works. That's what I do. Uh, so actually, so this, this model here uh, is a result of just one such simulation uh, where we said, okay, well, let's take this Earth model. Let's slow down the rotation. Let's, for the moment, get rid of the continents because we don't know anything about them. We'll just assume it's ocean everywhere. Not unreasonable. There are probably some planets like that. Uh, and then let's see what it does. You run it. It takes you know, a few weeks. Uh, and so this model, you're only seeing here ice and cloud cover. But the model also includes wind speed, it includes water vapor in the atmosphere, uh, you know, basically everything you could, you could want. Um, so we, that, that is the way we, we do this. And so when I say that we want to study climate uh, and understand it better, that's really what we're doing is we're taking these models and we're poking and prodding and seeing how, the, how do the different systems interact. And does that give us clues about how they might be observable even when we can't actually see the thing we're interested in? Uh, so I'll repeat the first question because I forgot to. The question was, do we ever take these hugely expensive climate models and use them for this stuff? Uh, and the second question is, do I ever get anything other than eyeballs and lobsters, uh, that kind of stuff? Um, yes and no. Uh, if you put in continents, uh, then you can start to deviate from that a little bit. Um, but at that point, you're really just kind of speculating and uh, modeling fantasy planets, which there's definitely room for because it gives you a sense of how much they vary. But this overall pattern, uh, this stays pretty constant. If you have a planet with one side facing the star uh, and it rotates relatively slowly, the side facing the star will be the warmest part. Maybe you have a little bit of structure in here, but this will st stay true. In the back. Uh, the, gem, the James Webb Space Telescope is coming soon. Uh, how, many of your, <laughs> how many of your questions do you hope that it might answer? You know, I don't know. Uh, so, James, uh, so the question is, the James Webb Space Telescope is going to launch soon, hopefully. Uh, how much can it contribute to this? James Webb is partly designed to look for exoplanets and be able to look at Earth-sized worlds and really kind of nail down what their atmospheres look like. Uh, so with that, we're basically looking at transiting planets. We're looking at the ones at which we can do this kind of thing. You know, looking for the light passing through the atmosphere and put together a spectrum. Uh, James Webb will give us the ability to see more planets, so we'll have more to look at, uh, and maybe by that we can learn a little bit more. Um, but ultimately, this is a case where people who are doing observations are miles ahead of the theorists. You know, they have the capability to look at these planets, but we don't really necessarily understand what the planets are going to look like. So one of the things that we're interested in is, can we maybe predict, by understanding climate better, what they might be looking for that might tell them about the actual climate? So the answer is maybe. Uh, we'll definitely have to see. It's usually the case with the new telescopes that we're surprised, that we think we know what we're going to see, and then we go and look, and we're completely wrong. Uh, so I'm, I'm hopeful and optimistic that that will be the case with James Webb, that we will have some pleasant surprises. Uh, I think your hand's been up for a while. So, so the question is, uh, well, you don't know the continents, but what if you just put some in uh, and then just let it run and see what you get? Uh, let it read a steady state and figure out what the answer is. Uh, well, so there are, I think there are two parts to that. For one, you can do that, and that will give you some sense of what the different ranges of possible climates are. Uh, some of them will break your model because you end up in a place where the continents are placed just right that the planet gets really hot, and then the model breaks because it's not built for hot planets. Um, but part of the problem is that uh, when we talk about a steady state for the atmosphere or for the climate, that's not something that's staying still. Uh, a steady state for Earth is still incredibly dynamic. Uh, and if you want to get that steady state right, you need to nail all of the feedbacks. Uh, because where you end up depends on everything along the way. Uh, 
and so we only talked about some of the different things that interact in the climate today, but there's so much more. There's, you really do have to include the entire planet if you want to really nail it. Yes? So the question is, some of Jupiter's moons and some of Saturn's moons have liquid water oceans under an icy crust. Uh, so they're far from the sun, they're outside the habitable zone. Why not look at those? What do you know about those? Uh, so the short answer is that those are very promising places to look for life. If I had to personally place money on where we'll find life first, it's going to be on one of those moons. Those moons are kept warm enough to have liquid water because they're stretched and pulled by Jupiter and Saturn, by the gravity of these planets. Uh, and that creates heat. Um, but in terms of sitting here on Earth and looking, well, they're under a kilometer of ice or more. Uh, so it, it's really hard to see if there's anything there. Um, so unfortunately, we won't really know an answer to that until we can send probes that can drill into the ice, uh, which they are looking at. That, that is on the drawing board. Um, but my guess is not in the next few decades, um, but in terms of where you might find life, that might actually be the most common place to find it, is in the oceans of uh, icy, icy worlds like that. Are we time for one last question? I see a hand way far in the back there. Uh, so the question is about what's called the wow signal. Uh, this was a radio signal that we received um, uh, at, at SETI telescopes uh, a couple decades ago, uh, and it looked pretty much exactly what we would expect a transmission from aliens to look like. And so the person watching wrote, wow, in the margins. Uh, we never saw anything else like it after that. Um, so this is the only example we have. We have one data point. Uh, so it is possible that it's aliens. So the question is, uh, could something else have produced it? And the answer is yes, probably. Uh, we don't necessarily know of any physical mechanism that could cause that, but that doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Um, and we also can't rule out the role of instruments. Uh, instruments sometimes fail, they sometimes glitch. Uh, sometimes you get something that causes a spike in a signal. And because it only happened once, we have no way of testing whether or not it was the instrument. Uh, so it's a great question. Um, I'm hopeful that maybe someday we'll get more of those signals and we will find aliens. But it's, at this point, we have nothing to go on besides we'll listen, but it doesn't sound like anybody's there at the moment. Okay, so that brings an end to our top portion of the evening. But as I mentioned, we have other things that will be happening uh, for the rest of the evening. So one thing is that we have planetarium shows. If you signed up online for the 910 planetarium show, Terry here, you can uh, meet with him outside and we'll lead you to the planetarium meet point, which maybe I'll just bring... So up here, if you go down to the first floor, there's an elevator lobby uh, to head out to the tower. The elevator lobby is the meet point for the planetarium show, so for the 910 show, again, you can follow Terry. If you're seeing a later show, uh, just make sure you meet there by the time of your planetarium show. We also have tickets available if you didn't sign up in advance. And out of over here, he uh, outside will have the tickets for you to pick up a ticket. Uh, we also have uh, demos, we have some fun interactive things, we have an Oculus Rift, we have some 3D telescopes, uh, we have a tour of our observatory, uh, I think it's probably still cloudy outside, unfortunately. We have food, everyone loves free food. Um, another thing I mentioned before is that uh, we don't have an Astro Tour uh, in April uh, because we're running our Earth Hour event that's on Saturday, March 24th at 7 p.m. We have uh, Professor Sherwood Lawler doing a talk that I'm really excited about. Um, so I suggest if you like Astro Tours, you come out to that. Um, and so let's thank Adib again one more time for that great. <laughs> and you also have your feedback forms. So if you'd like to hand them in, just 